I mean, you just all introduce yourself, so we're not in, going to introduce all the people on the web, but some people just did, you know, make the effort to present themselves, so I'll just take this uh, opportunity just to, if, we, if you can see us, just, uh, I've got just three persons for the moment having uh, uh, responded, so we've got, for example, uh, Samane, sorry for the name, if I just don't say them uh, right, uh, from Iran. Um, excuse me, from Iran, and she, t she tells us, um, I'm, let me check, sorry. Um, she's uh, from Iran, she's graduated in environmental civil engineering. She's teaching industrial wastewater treatment at university, and she applied for PhD of environment in field of pollution. So we would have, for example, Samane, we've got uh, Noor. Uh, Noor Abdu, she's from uh, Jordan, uh, she's got a PhD from Jordan, um, uh, assist, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health uh, at the College of Medicine in Jordan University uh, of Science and Technology. And we've got, last thing, and then I'll leave you, Maurizio. <laughs> Massimo, sorry. Um, sorry, we've got Therese, uh, Therese uh, Salamé, yes, that uh, Eric knows. Uh, and Therese was as working, uh, is it, IMT, IMT in Lille, uh, north of France, Lille Douai, and she's a postdoctoral fellow in atmospheric chemistry, working on emissions, sources, measurement of pollutants. That's all, just, well, just to, to create a link with internet and you. Sorry. That was nice, okay. thank, you. That was nice. thank you for doing that. And we, do, we know both do, do, um, uh, two persons, Nour Abdou, we know her also because we met her at the Cyprus meeting last, uh, I don't remember when was that, but. Okay. So. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me for, to, to, to talk about this topic. I know you might be a little bit tired, so I will try to keep it as more informal and uh, light as possible. So the topic is our quality measurements, and I also added modeling because, uh, of course, I am just a few words about my background. I am a statistician, and I work as an epidemiologist in the Department of Epidemiology in Rome. So I am not an expert in air quality measurements in terms of you know, engineering of the monitoring sites and stuff. I'm not really a modeler in terms of air quality models. So my perspective will be entirely in terms of uh, what shall we do with this uh, data, with this air pollution estimates with the purpose of estimating health effects and with the purpose of uh, implementing um, health impact assessment procedures. So just that I think that was uh, important. I will not speak too much about the definitions because I, I think most of us will know what air pollution is just to, to, to agree on some of the aspects. I think also we are a little bit uh, late in, in, in the schedule, so I will try to skip some of the, of the slides. But basically when we speak about air pollution, we speak about the presence of toxic chemicals or compounds not just anthropogenic, but also, also uh, natural, biological, in the air at levels which might pose a health risk. So this is our perspective here. There are, of course, many, many different pollutants which might, we might be interested in. The ones I'm reporting here are those which are uh, uh, included in the EU legislation because there is some evidence in some cases, it's a very massive and convincing evidence. In other cases, not as much. But there is some evidence of their health effects. They are toxic for human health. So there are gases like uh, SO2 and nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen oxides. We will speak a little bit more about the PM, particulate matter, because that is the pollutant. Also, Carla was pointing out about PM as being in the top 10 uh, uh, risk factors for human health from the global burden of disease. That's the one where most of the research, but also most of the, uh, is, let's say, policy agenda is focused on. There are, of course, metals, there is ozone, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many different pollutants which we, we might be interested in uh, focusing. When we speak about pollution, we think about sources, and I'm sure there are people in this room much more experienced than me about, you know, identifying sources or maybe apportioning different sources to specific amounts of concentrations. But here, when we speak about sources, we don't speak only about uh, anthropogenic sources, like usual ones, like industry or traffic 
or uh, you know, uh, waste disposal. We also think about natural events. And since we are speaking about the Mediterranean area, but there are also people from, uh, from uh, uh, Iran or other places which are very much impacted by dust events, that's another source which might, we, we might be interested in. So natural events which might pose a real threat to, to human health. So there is a, a very a, a extensive uh, a list of possible sources which uh, uh, we should take into, into account. And also when we speak, when we think about pollution, first of all, of course, we think about primary pollutants, which are those directly emitted in the atmosphere or near the ground where we go to measure these pollutants. And this is a list of primary pollutants, but there are also secondary pollutants. So basically, those pollutants, we just come after chemical reactions, so they are not directly emitted by the sources, but they derive from chemical reactions which occur in the low atmosphere. One example is ozone. Ozone is not a primary pollutant. It can be transported through long-range transport, but or basically most of it uh, is uh, uh, it, it comes from reactions, so it's a secondary secondary pollutant. We already spoke about concentration, so maybe we don't go too much in to these specific uh, uh, definitions, just to say that uh, air pollutants, uh, we measure them in terms of concentrations, which is basically the, 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 the ratio between uh, the, the, the mass of a pollutant we are accounting and uh, the volume of air we, ha we have in mind. And generally, they are measured in terms of, uh, for example, NO2 in terms of micrograms per cubic meters. So as I was saying, uh, there are, we, th th this talk is, speaks about measurements, but I will not speak too much about that. There are, just to say that there are reference methods uh, existing for each pollutant that they are defined by law. In some cases, these methods are much, very much consolidated and automated, so no big need of, uh, you know, maintenance or, uh, or uh, going there for the, for the individual operator and uh, retrieve the, 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 the measurements. And that's the case for most of the gases, for example. There are other cases where, in principle, the reference method for PM would entail the weighting of a filter, which is a lot of work from an individual operator. But luckily, there are, there are uh, equivalent methods which have been tested and uh, proved to be absolutely reliable, uh, which are much more automatic. And uh, I, again, I, I'm sure there are people in this room which know about this much more, more than me. So a, a few words about uh, particular matter, because I think that this will be the pollutant where we, most of our attention will be focused during this week. Particular matter is, as the word says, it's not just a single you know, gas, a single uh, uh, molecule. It's a complex heterogeneous mixture of solid and liquid components. And because it is a complex and heterogeneous mixture, its toxicity might very much vary depending on the source profiles, depending on the steady area, depending on the reactions with the uh, uh, meteorological patterns, etc. Sources can be very different from power plants, industries, motor vehicles in, in cities, of course. In general, traffic is one of the most important uh, sources, but also domestic heating. And, uh, but also natural sources. Again, this is very relevant in uh, areas like southern Europe or some uh, large uh, uh, areas in Asia also where there is a lot of impact from uh, arid regions. <clears throat> there are several definitions, but basically one of the most uh, uh, distinction between different types of PM is in terms of the size of PM because uh, the finer, in principle, this is quite easy to understand. The finer the size, the, the easier the penetration of the particles into human body. And so most of the, of the uh, uh, let's say, research agenda now is focusing on the, the la latter one, the ultrafine particles, which is particular matter with a diameter smaller than 0.1 microns, which is the very finest one, and those which might not just stop in the upper respiratory system, but it get, can go down to the lower tract. It can translocate to the, to, to the blood circulation. 
it can impact also peripheral or organs, so determining a number of different adverse effects. This is where most of the research is going, but the most of the available evidence is about fine particles, both because uh, in, in the US it has been monitored since 20, nearly 30 years now, but also because uh, fine particles compared with the quartz fraction, which is this one, they also have been shown to, to, to cause a number of different adverse effects, not just respiratory, but also cardiovascular effects. And now the spectrum of the potential effects of these particles has, been, has increased a lot. Now we know that it might impact also uh, neurobehavioral uh, systems and also the neurodegenerative diseases. And it's bad for... Uh, uh, pregnant women for, with a number of different adverse effects on the, on the new babies, etc. So there is a wide spectrum of potential effects of the fine particles. But also I think for us it's important also to focus on coarse particles. I think for us thinking about, for example, the Mediterranean area where we know that many particles might come from arid regions and we know that uh, the, so the, 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 the sites of these particles might be also in the quartz, in the quartz mode. So this is one quite typical uh, distinction of, of a different PM. And here, this is a nice picture which is always shown, just to give you an idea, what do we mean by ultrafine particles? So we are on the same range as viruses, fine particles, the same size as bacteria. The quartz fraction is more on the size of the cell or pollen. So this is just to give a, a, a comparison scale for different size, sizes of PM. And the source profile might differ between fine and coarse fraction. Okay, so uh, this has been already touched by Carla. When we speak about air pollution, of course, we have in mind uh, emissions because air pollution is uh, caused by emissions, but not they are not uh, the only a cause of higher concentrations because in addition to emissions, we need to have transport and diffusion of the pollutants. And so there is an important role which is played also by meteorology, by orography, by a number of different issues that will be touched during this whole week. Okay. Low limits, I think it's quite important for our purposes because uh, they very often help uh, investigators to define uh, uh, counterfactual scenarios. What do we mean by air pollution as an impact uh, compared to what? Generally, when we want to define the, the reference uh, uh, base uh, compared to which we, we, we do the health impact assessment, we need some sort of threshold above which to define the impact. And this is also will be, will be uh, discussed in the next few days for in each pollutant. There are different uh, low limits, and these low limits might uh, be defined in terms of uh, daily variability of air pollution, but also in terms of annual averages, depending on whether we are interested in uh, estimating the impact on the short term or on the long term uh, effect of air pollution. This is just an, an example of uh, the PN10 monitoring network in Italy, where you can see, for example, in the red dots, that uh, these are places here, all the red dots, where there, there has been an exceedance of the uh, limit values uh, compared to what the, the, the legislation say it is acceptable. So with a detrimental effect for the population living in these areas, but also with economic impact because uh, when there are these exceedances, there is some infringement procedure from the Euro European Commun Commission. Okay, more or less I've just said this. I think this is quite important to, to, to bear in mind. When, when we speak about uh, uh, PN concentrations in Europe, you see there are, this is not the, the latest report. Now the situation has, has, has a little bit improved, but you see there are large areas with a lot of, uh, I mean, red dots, which means that in those, in those cases, the population lives in uh, places where the, the limit values are exceeded, and so there is a real uh, threat to human health. But it's also interesting to see that if we consider the EU, the European Union, 
air quality standards, only 21% of the population live in places which exceed such limits. But if we, instead we consider the WHO, the World Health Organization, air quality guidelines, which are, I mean, tr lower thresholds than those com defined by the European Union legislation, this percentage is 81%. I think this point also will be touched in the next few days, but this is just to say that this air pollution is a real problem for the, the population in Europe, and this is the same also in other continents, because many, many people live in places where the, the, the levels of air pollution are not at all safe for their health. So we spoke about uh, uh, measurements, but uh, when we do health impact assessment, uh, we are not, and also Carla showed a slide uh, with different type, different, let's say, quality levels of, uh, of uh, uh, air pollution uh, uh, estimates. We are not just uh, okay with the few point of measurements that are available on the, on the territory because they are, not, they, they are not able to capture, you know, the very small scale uh, spatial variability. And so we really need to rely on models which complement the measurements and allow us to assess air pollution exposure to each and every individual in, in, in a steady area. There are different ways to do this. I will just mention briefly dispersion models because this is one of the most consolidated one, but there, are, there will be experts, I think, in the next few days which will provide more details about how dispersion model works. But basically the idea of these models is that they simulate uh, emissions, transport, dispersion, and deposition of airborne pollutants, and also their chemical reactions. So these models are based on uh, complex systems of uh, mathematical equations, using fly, fl fluid dynamic laws, of course, so that having all these ingredients, emissions, transport, meteorological fields, etc., they are able to predict in this place, as an average this year, for example, how much NO2 will be uh, present in terms of concentrations. And this is just an example of the complexity of the system in the, in the Lazio region, which is the, the, the region in central Italy where Rome is located, where you can see there are many different pieces which enter the, the, the chain, and the, the, the final output will be something like this, having either at the regional domain or for the metropolitan area of Rome, having a, a sort of a map where you can see the predicted concentrations of uh, uh, of the pollutant, uh, and then uh, the next step, as Carla was saying before, will be to assess and to, to, to attribute these levels to the population living in Rome, and so to make the connection between uh, how much exposed they were and, uh, how, uh, and uh, how much their health was uh, impacted by these levels of exposure. Another possibility, which is in a way complementary to the dispersion model, is the land use regression models. Again, there will be people talking about this, in, I think, tomorrow. But the idea here is that uh, these models are aimed to predict, these are statistical models, not as much uh, mathematical models based on, uh, you know, specific uh, physical laws. These are statistical models which try to predict pollutant concentrations in different spatial locations by taking advantage of the special relationship between observations and land use characteristics. These models can be very easy or very complex depending on how many uh, data sources we want to use to, to better characterize uh, the distribution of air pollutants over space, but they generally need as input observed measurements of the pollutant from one or more monitoring campaigns, of course, then we need data on land use characteristics. Uh, for example, we need to have uh, the, the road network if we think that the traffic might be one important uh, component to describe the, 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 the special patterns of our pollutant. We need to have a uh, orography, we need to have land cover, et cetera, et cetera, population density. There is a need of some GIS expert here who takes all this data, handle the data, and attribute to each point a vector of different parameters. And then once we have this, we need to develop uh, 
a prediction model for, uh, for uh, the, the air pollutant uh, we have uh, uh, in our study. So this is just a brief example of the complexity that we have uh, developed for, for Italy, where basically the aim was to predict for each day and for each square kilometer the PM concentrations. So we built a, a grid of one by one kilometer for all, all our country. We collected a number of different, uh, uh, many different types of data, starting from PM monitors. We have nearly 700 monitors in, in Italy. And basically we use satellite data in order to be able not just to capture the spatial variability, but also the temporal variability. Yes? <laughs> no, no, it will take. One minute, maybe two. <coughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so we, we collected information about the satellite data. So the, the, the left side is aerosol optical depth, which is a parameter which has to do with the amount of particles which are in the column of air, as a, I mean, uh, retrieved from the satellites. Where on the right side, sorry, on the right side here, you have a, a map of, of the vegetation from the a normalized difference vegetation index, which is also a, a satellite parameter. We collected this information, and as I was saying before, using a lot of GIS techniques, we attributed to each one by one kilometer square a number of parameters, like in this example, population density, or uh, we checked whether there were important industrial emission points which might impact the air pollution in each square. We consider the Korean land cover database to characterize each point in, in, in Italy in terms of land use characteristics, the road network to distinguish between highways, major and minor roads in order also to capture the, 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 the footprint from, from traffic. The other special parameters, I'm just going uh, over them quite quickly, just to give you an idea of how much work you can implement with the aim of predicting a, a PM concentrations in this case everywhere for every day. And these are other, for example, Saharan dust, that's a topic which can be of relevance in many different areas, for example, in, in Africa, of course, or in, uh, in, uh, in the Middle Asia, not just in Southern Europe. We detected these uh, uh, desert dust events and we used also those by using a mixture of models, including you know, atmospheric models, back trajectories, etc. Okay, meteorological data, we already mentioned those, and we have implemented a, a multi-stage approach. I will not go into this, just to, to show which was the final, uh, let's say, output of this effort. This is the annual, uh, the, the average across 2006-2012 of PN10 in Italy. But basically, behind this map, there are daily maps like this, which can be very useful to whatever health impact assessment uh, uh, methodology we want to apply, which is either in the long-term scale, so focusing on the spatial contrasts, or on the short-term scale, so focusing on the, uh, sorry, on the daily scale, so focusing on the short-term contrast. These, these are annual maps. And this is the temporal day-by-day -day variability, because depending on whether we are focusing on the short-term or long-term effects, we might want to use either the spatial or the temporal variability in our estimates. So I've finished. And of course, if there are questions, I will keep it. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Any questions? Thank you, Massimo. Is that type of effort done in other countries than Italy? The, you are speaking about the last part about this spatiotemporal temporal country-wide model. Yep. This has been done in several other countries, in, in Europe at least, and in US. For sure, it has been done in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, in France. We are doing this in Spain and in Sweden as well. So there is an, an effort in trying to apply this kind of methodology European-wide in order to have a sort of, uh, you know, 
a standardized approach to, to, to then run all the impact assessment models we want. But yes, there is a, an effort in replicating this in several countries. Thank you, Massimo. Very nice. I would like to take the opportunity to see whether people want to intervene on which kind of data they have. Because if we want to, <laughs> to, to do you, I think satellite data now exists for the entire world. Yeah, yeah, these Mainly, are available, for example. Yeah, freely available since 2000, I mean. Yeah. They will stop probably. I heard that the NASA is cutting money, etc. But I know. Uh, for now, they are still uh, on. Yes, in, and there will be new satellites also uh, being launched very soon, at least for Europe. But I mean, there, there have, have been used. These methods have been used in China, have been used in India, have been used in many other countries, not just in Europe. So hopefully so they will go. at least uh, you know that for your country you will have that this is a, a yeah, good uh, yeah. point of departure plus uh, monitoring uh, if you have a stations or uh, uh, now it's very up to date to, to have uh, this uh, remote sensor with the participatory networking people uh, carrying that and uh, giving you uh, in different uh, places, uh, uh, but this is an important step of your, uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I mean, of, of your uh, health, health impact assessment. You really need uh, the, the, the assessment of air pollution to be uh, sure to make mm -hmm. uh, a reasonable... Uh, no, I think this is very uh, relevant point. I mean, I was listening before some of you mentioned that I think it was some someone there about having these filters with this uh, XRF and this kind of uh, daily measurements. So I think the, the major uh, distinction we might try to understand is whether you have uh, some sort of very refined uh, measurements like, like the ones you were mentioning before, which maybe do not cover the entire space, but it's only a few monitoring sites, but they will be perfect to capture the day-to-day -day variability. And so that's one thing, because then if that's the case, maybe you might be more into the short-term part, understanding whether this day-to-day -day variability is more related with the daily mortality or hospitalizations, versus on the other opposite is there are, if there are models which are able to describe or to predict the, the air pollution on the spatial scale, then that's another story, because in that case we are more into the long-term effect and the more conventional, let's say, health impact assessment uh, approach. So this is a first distinction we might try to, to, to make to understand who has what, I mean, in terms of data. Uh, Massimo would have a question from Jose um, from the University of uh, Colombia, uh, asking how precise is the model with respect to actual measurements and for how long in the future can this model predict? Okay, so the, I guess the question was about the, 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 the spatial temporal model satellite based, which I presented uh, uh, in, the, in the last slides. So th that is a, a statistical approach. It's not a, a forecasting model, so we don't have that model for the future. We have it uh, based on historical data. So until now, we have done it. Uh, the, the, that slide was about. 2006, 2012. We have it now updated until 2016, and in principle it can be done year by year, but not in, as a forecasting model. So that's, a, 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 I think it's important to, to understand this. Second, in terms of how precise that is, uh, it was very good. I mean, we did all the efforts to cross-validate the model against the measurements. So the idea was that we have our monitoring sites we remove some of the sites, we predict the model on the others, actually we feed the model on the others and we predict on the left out monitors and re we repeat this approach over and over again so we, we are making sure that there is no overfitting, let's call it, in, in the model itself. And we were able to predict more than 70% of the observed concentrations from the left out monitors, which for us being this an, a nationwide effort was a good achievement. That was a question he asked. Yeah. 
thank you for the presentation. I, I have just uh, a curiosity. Uh, you say that uh, in other countries of Europe, this satellite-based model is being implemented right now, and it could be a reference model for uh, health impact assessment. My question is, uh, how it relates, for example, we know that in France, Chimer is the, uh, the, the, the model for prediction. In Italy, we have uh, uh, many, uh, but okay, yeah. every, every, and sorry, sorry, just, sure. and, and uh, at uh, European level, there is this good, uh, this uh, great effort to put or to compare all the model based on, uh, uh, emission sources. Uh, my, my, my question is how this model can coexist, I mean the, the satellite-based model can co coexist to the more classical, uh, let's say, particulate matter or air pollution models? Thank you. Okay, I will just give a brief, and then you can, uh, and Isabella, you can speak about the French situation. They can coexist very well simply because they are completely different. I mean, they are very much complementary because, as I was saying in the slides, they come from different perspectives. In terms of the agreement with the, the Italian spatial temporal model and the MINI, it's quite good. It's not perfect. I mean, it's like 0.5 correlation, which to me is good because uh, since they are so much different in terms of, you know, uh, philosophy, they they are very good, well correlated, but especially if you look at the maps predicted for the two, you will see exactly the same hotspots, the same, I mean, the same pattern, special patterns. So this is a good thing. And the second issue, there is now the idea of fusing them. I mean, the next step will be to kind of come up with a sort of, a, let's say, su super model where you try to to exploit the benefits of both into a single estimate. So the idea is, is that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, uh, I, Cara then is completing because we made this work in France, Chimera because mm -hmm. we have a, a satellite also monitoring a station. Actually, overall, I agree with you. There is a good agreement. But if you really want to, uh, to assess the uncertainty, mm -hmm. one model uh, compared to the others, you can have uh, some places. Uh, I remember is uh, that uh, it's uh, where it's not urban uh, that you have uh, some uh, differences for mm -hmm. metropolitan France and uh, but uh, uh, so we are going to publish I hope uh, this <laughs> soon but uh, the trend is really to have uh, one model that uh, include uh, everything and uh, Augusta uh, Colette is going to talk uh, tomorrow or no Wednesday mm -hmm. about uh, Chimer okay. and other things. That's perfect. Yeah, sorry, just to add, so we looked at, at differences between satellite data and Chimer data, and, uh, and we saw that, um, if I remember correctly, one was systematically higher, I mean, slightly, not much, um, than the other, except in urban areas, where the other was, was systematically higher for each, for each grid point. So I'll, I'll look that up and, and get back to you if you want. Huh? Uh, for, I think it was PM 2.5 or PM 10, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, one, one did, I, I don't want to say better or worse because I don't have an actual, but we did also compare with, with, uh, with measurements. Okay, we have, uh, you know, we can discuss, yeah, sure, but we, uh, we don't run out of time, so we have one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe uh, Laziz that was telling that, but I didn't hear. The, the, the way the modelers are, are going on is to make ensemble modeling systems. So you are comparing several models and you realize that most often the average of your, all of your models is um, better than any of the models. 
And then the modeling uh, community now is assimilating satellite observation as well as surface observations. And this gives you what they call analysis, which is the most realistic um, simulation that you can get with a full temporal and spatial coverage. And that's probably the, the way that you are going to have the best uh, results for these uh, impact studies. Thank you. And it was just a curiosity because the colleague uh, talked about uh, Schumer and uh, also Mini, in it, that is a model used in Italy. And uh, I know also, for example, Camix, uh, that is another uh, Eulerian model used. And from my experience, uh, a problem with this model could be also the computational time. For example, to do a simulation all over Italy I cannot estimate now, but the computational time is uh, a lot. So I was, uh, I was wondering uh, which are, in this sense, uh, the benefits of this kind of models that, that honestly, I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, and this is a good point, of course. Computational time, uh, I mean, in terms of computational time, I speak about this model, it's not that big because we are able to run one full model for one year in maybe a few hours. So it's not uh, days, it's not weeks. Of course you need computational power. I mean, you, you need a large computer, a cluster, something like that. The nice thing is that now everything is parallelizable, of course, so let's say the technology helps us in uh, optimizing the process. In terms of time, uh, it's not a big issue because as I was saying, this is a, a very statistical approach. I mean, what we have done in the latest part was using machine learning techniques to, to, to do the, the, the job, and it was not so much intensive, I would say. I mean, one, one, uh, we can do one year daily for 300,000 cells, which is the square kilometer of Italy, in a few hours. Yeah, I've talked to that, you have used uh, approximately 700 uh, monitor sites for your calculation. My question is, I would like to know, what is the minimum monitor site can be used for a good, precise uh, calculation? <laughs> and this how... is a, a very different question, a difficult question. I mean, yes, we had in total 700, but year by year, they were not 700. They went, f let's say on average, every year we had uh, more or less 500. But then some of those, I mean, were some, in some cases, there were some more stations, but others were uh, kind of uh, uh, closed. So in, in total, we had 700. So we, went, we, we started in 2006, not because we didn't have uh, satellite data. Satellite data go back until the 90s. But because we, for only from 2006, we had, uh, uh, let's say, a reasonable enough number of monitoring sites to train the model. For us, this reasonable enough was something like 300 out of uh, the, the whole Italy. I mean, I know of other uh, exercises where they are only focusing, for example, on New Delhi in India. They had like 30 to 35, 40 monitors, which is perfect if the study area is smaller. So it's relative to the size of the study area because in the end, what you do is to train a model on those points, but then you want to predict every other, in all, the, in all the other places. So the more reliable these monitors are to represent the study area, then it's okay. But if you have only few monitors to predict a very large area, you don't trust the predictions anymore. Thank you very much. So we now have, well, sorry, though that you have. A... Okay, we have a 